Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast. My next guest is an award-winning broadcaster. She's an anchor for Sports Center on TSN, a reporter covering the Toronto Raptors for the network, and the first black woman in Canada to host a flagship sports highlight program in the country. I was at a place where I'm like, do I really belong here? Like, am I really made and cut out for this industry? And then someone essentially told me, no. Remember when so-and-so said this, and you still did it anyways, and you thrive? Like... Baby girl, you are it, right? Like, sometimes you just need those moments. I fought for myself, and I said, you know what? If I get blackballed, then this is just not for me. But what I can't do is sacrifice my integrity. I never had anything handed. I worked for everything. And and I'm damn good. Like, is it, like check the receipts. Like, I'm actually really good at my job. My guest today is Kayla Gray, who's just launched her new show, The Shift with TSN where she'll have great Canadian discussions about sports, life, and culture all in one place. And I got to start by saying she is not only the host of The Shift, she's also executive producer. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me just feel myself a little bit with that one, huh? <laughs> Congrats on the launch. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been it's been a wild couple of months, I feel like. You're really in the spotlight right now, and I've heard you comment on other podcasts and other interviews you've done that you sort of like being behind the scenes. So how are you feeling right now? Yeah, it's uh, I love being able to really, really tap into my creative side. Um, I love to be able to kind of ideate ideas and yeah, I like to front them, but also like pass them off to other people to front or, you know, work on and work with a team on our social media strategy or what our website's looking like or what the show ideation's looking like. I feel like my mind works best in those ways. Um, And not to say like, you know, presenting I'm like bad at, but um, I like when my mind's constantly challenged. And so this has been amazing. Um, Just the feedback so far has been incredible as well. And people resonating with people, people loving it, getting it. Um, but yeah, and, and just excited that we have so much to build on. Um, you know, we've only just had two episodes and we have a lot more to go. So um, I'm just excited for where this, this can take uh, shape and form. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to talk about your, your accolades and the history that you've made <laughs> as, as a broadcaster. But I think a, a big topic of discussion on this podcast is empowerment. And, you know, hearing you say that Dell came on board and had no reservations they were just yeah. like, yep, all good. T- talk to oh, me about putting probably, the show together. Like, yeah, we should have ran that back a few times. <laughs> talk to me about the the pitch and putting that together. I don't know about you. It sounds like we both had a uh, very similar experience in schooling in that we maybe took the scenic route to where we wanted to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I, yeah and I'm a big person who likes to like, visualize. So it kind of started off like, Last summer, of course, there were a lot of conversations about lack of diversity in sport media and what we can do to change. And I was just like, okay, what would I want it to actually look like, though? Um, And so I was like, what segments would I want? What stories would I want to be told? How would I want these stories to be told? And it just sort of snowballed into like napkins. And then it turned into like a one pager and then a deck. And I was like, hmm, all right. Well, you know, you just keep rolling with it. And it was something I just felt really passionate about. And it was a really tough time of year, I think, for a lot of people. Um, And for me, this was one thing that kept me focused and kept me, uh, you know, going. And, you know, you get to a point, I think, when you have ideas where you don't really trust it, like I was really insecure about it, where you're like, what is going to come of this? Like, people aren't going to buy into this. We aren't going to do anything with this. They're not going to, you know, who, who am I to have this show idea? Um, but then, you know, I aligned with Ken Wong, who's also an executive producer on the show and brand partnerships. And he was like, man, like, I want to do something like this too. And so that's sort of how the ball started rolling. Um, and then came Dell and Dell didn't really have that much feedback. And I was like, really scary because you're like, damn, then this is really all on you. Okay. Like you better get this together. Um, but no, I think just like 
having people trust in your vision is a massive, massive bonus. And when it comes to like being cre a creative, um, and so, yeah, then now we're here and we have a whole show and, and, uh, you know, I guess it's working out. Yeah. What's the toughest moment been about the launch so far? Cause there's so many moving pieces oh. when you launch something like this. Yeah. Feeling like you don't have time for everything. Yeah. You know, um, we're getting episode one together. We had shot it on the Tuesday. It was to launch on the Thursday because we wanted it to be topical. We wanted it to be fresh. Um, but then also as people know because they've probably seen me all up and down the place there's press around that there's photo shoots around that and so your energy and your time is spread so so thin and for me I love to pay attention to details and I love to make sure that things are seen through and you know I've got my eyes on everything and it was the hardest lesson for me to learn to let go like to let go that it might not be perfect but it's a great starting spot um, to let go that like, you know, your eyelash might be falling off during your hit. It's fine. <laughs> just power through it. Like, you, you know, there's, you just said, and also to like to trust your team. Um, you know, sure. This was a, something that started in, in my house, but at the end of the day, like people that have joined onto the team truly believe in it. And they've also become very invested as well. And so why would they let it fail? And so you just have to like, let go in that sense of like, just let people do their thing. I'm a very control, like I had I, control is, is one of my biggest hiccups. And it's very hard sometimes for me to let go of said control. It helps me in cases, it hurts me in others. And so that was one of the biggest challenges. I hear so much of myself and what you're saying. 100%. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. You gotta let go. Okay, so if you had to pinpoint, you know, a moment or a seed or a conversation maybe with an athlete that you had either seen or had that sort of birthed to this idea for the shift. What is it? Oh my gosh. Alan Iverson back, uh, when the NBA all-star weekend was in Toronto and it was like on a whim, I wasn't even on air. I was like working radio at TSN at the time. And for some reason, known to me, I ended up at this like capsule space in, uh, where is it? Yorkville. And Alan Iverson was talking about, you know, his shoe with Reebok. And it was like 21 questions with Alan Iverson. And after that, I was like shy to it. I'm like, can I ask you a couple questions? And, uh, you know, he was so gracious and gave me the time. But it was just so real and authentic. And it felt like a conversation. And, you know, not that I was great at, at asking the questions, but I was like, you know, I go back to that because I'm like, you know, what if we had spaces where um, it just feels like a conversation, where it just feels natural, where it just feels like, you know, there is, uh, you know, just an ease to it. There is also excitement when it comes to digesting certain things. I feel like we've, for so long, um, news has been told to us a certain way. And uh, for me, it, it does resonate because I'm also in that space, but for others, it doesn't because it just either goes above their head or it's not digestible. It doesn't add nuance. Um, and so that's where that, that's where I think that can, that, that would sprout out of. You know what a, a good parallel for that might be even like how, for example, Raptors, once they're out of the playoffs, people drop off, right? Uh -huh. Like the diehard basketball fans are there to see what happens through to the end. So this might be similar. It's like to have the conversations the entire way through instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, and, and the, the greatest thing too, is it's like, uh, we are almost like the Raptors in their NBA 2019 championship year in a sense of like, we don't have like the diehard basketball fans, but there's interest because there's feel. And so, you know, obviously with my sports background, that's sort of like the in, in every episode, but we also dive into other things like entertainment and fashion and music. And so that's what I think helps bring in and spread the audience is they do feel as though there's a place for them as well. And the topic in sports that we talk about too, like uh, our last episode, we we're talking about NBA Top Shot and how it might be problematic down the line when we're thinking about betting on someone else's labor. I think that resonates with everyone because oh, yeah. I think regular degulars like us, if we put in work, why should someone else benefit or profit off of that and bet on that? That's just the optics are all, also really strange. But and I don't think NBA Top Shot's a bad idea, but these are the conversations that have to take place when we're talking about things like NFTs or cryptocurrencies. Right. Yeah. And so uh, to me, it's it's yes, the sports is the in, but it broadens out into such a bigger conversation.
Yeah. What's a dream conversation you're hoping to have on your show, even if it's not booked yet? Oh my gosh. I would love to sit down with LeBron James and not even just talk about the playing career. I think to me, he's just a smart business guy. And the way that he's been able to put his other people on um, is incredible. Uh, And, and the way that he's just also been able to diversify his bag, like who are your, who, who's your Intel, who are your insiders, who's the business folks that are telling you where and what not to invest in him. Kevin Durant are two people I'd love to chat to the dream dream. Serena Williams, I think she's just such a boss. And also from a business standpoint, that's intriguing to me, but um, just her craft, the way she stays dedicated, the way that she also does not compromise as a mom when it comes to laying out the things that she needs in order for her to do both. I think that that would be a really good conversation. And we're going to say it out loud because it's going to manifest. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's make it happen. In what you're doing on the show, you know, you, you spoke about being relative and making sure that everything is fresh. For example, you know, after, let's say, a playoff game, regardless of the sport, you know, how do you keep that fresh when so much has happened since you taped? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that's what we love about this. Our show is biweekly. Um, but what we do commit to is making sure we're putting out fresh content every single day on the socials. Um, and so on social media, and that's the ways in which we're engaging, but it's also the ways in which our audience is also taking in their information and also engaging. Um, you know, they do show up for the big moments and the big TV moments, but also the, the nuances and the conversations outside of that, I think take place on a day-to-day basis outside of the show. Um, and so that's how we stay kind of in it. Um, we also have our website that's always, always updating as well. And then you kind of think of the the show itself of like, hey, what were the biggest topics that we were talking about? Um, and, and to me, you know, when we don't shy away from, you know, if we want to put up a video right away where I'm like, I got something to say and it's 12 o'clock on a Wednesday. I know we don't have an episode until next week. I can tape it and put it up and out there. Like we don't wait. So we don't wait to like tease things or be like, hey, interview with this big person's coming up. It's like, no, nah, let's just put it out. Yeah. And one, one of the comments that you made, like we're not going to fluff the end and fill to meet a certain time. Yeah. I, I love that. And I mean, you're working for, you know, a, a major company. So how, how does that fly? That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's uh, it's one of the things where actually our, our show commitment is pretty low, like in terms of like the minutes that we do and why that's beautiful is because we've <laughs> doubled the minutes every single time. But when you kind of have this low expectation, you then are like, okay, you have to be incredibly intentional about what goes into the show. I think, you know, sometimes uh, we don't give audiences as much credit um, when it comes to like when we yeah. build our shows and stuff, like they know when you've checked out in your, in your show, right? Like they know when you're just like, all right, I got this sponsor or this promo or this thing to put in here. Um, and so with us, we're like, listen, if we get a good solid 20 minutes of a show, then we're going to give you the good solid 20 minutes of that show. If we can only give you 14, then that's what it is. If we can give you 35, that's what it is. We're not so tied um, to that time frame because that's when you lose that, like, that that kind of push to make sure that the best stuff is coming out. I mean, I think we see this with like the Craves and the Netflix of the world with certain series, like some episodes are an hour, some just 40 minutes. Like, I, I think that audiences appreciate that. And so um, for me, that's sort of the thinking behind the non-committal of how actual long the show is. True. Well, congrats on the show. I'm glad that we started with that. And uh, it's going to come up, it's going to come up throughout the rest of this episode, but I, I'm really interested in understanding your your background. When I read about you know uh, school and how there were lots of skipping class and dropouts <laughs> and, and all that stuff, I mean, I I really that resonated with me because I was always the kid kicked out of class. And mm-hmm. I feel like those who know that I work you know in media now who maybe weren't my biggest fans oh, back this in is the day just a joke to my teachers. This is a joke. <laughs> this is like what. What, who? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, have you had any moments where like, you know, a former school has invited you to speak and things yes. like that? Yeah. Yes. How's that all going? I'm middle school and it's funny. They're still in my DMs and at some point I will answer, but I just like right now, I'm just like, I can't bring myself to it right now. Like <laughs> it's a lot of trauma revisiting for me. I am not ready to go there, um, but I it, obviously it, eventually is I that, will. Um, is that because you didn't feel uh, supported back yes. then? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I didn't feel supported back then. I think I've always had this like long standing with school where it just at times it just didn't make sense to me or I was so wrapped, caught up in my head about like life and other things and figuring myself out and not ever um, truly feeling understood. And that showed up in school and that showed up in the ways that I lashed out at school or skipped it or wasn't engaged. Um, and so it's like, it's funny now when you're an adult and you look back at your why and your inner child and like all the things and you're just like, oh, that's the middle school was. teachers are laughing at both of us. I can tell you. Oh right yeah. Now. Cause they probably sit in there like, girl, you, we know, <laughs> we knew we've been, we've been seeing you. We knew you were a hot mess. Like it's, you know, but I think it's such formative years. I don't think we give ourselves enough credit. Like from when you head into school to like when you head out, um, you're also like trying to figure out your your place in the world and your social standings and who you are and who you are to other people and what you need from other, like it's, you have to be so gracious when you look back on those years. Um, and it's funny, I deleted my Facebook a while ago because I was so terrified to look at high school photos. Cause I was, I was in a really bad place. I had really bad depression. Um, and there's like photos where like I shaved my head off, like I had my, my moments. Yeah. Um, I was just was never ready to face like who that person was. And eventually you get to a place where you're like, but, but that's all that you and, and that all goes into who you are today and who you, how you show up into this world and, and you're unique and you're, and you're great. Um, and so, yeah, it's been it's so wild how this last year has also been a, a big year of transformation and acceptance for me. What about young women? Has anyone reached out really, you know, thanking you for sort of sharing your story and all that? Yes. And I'm so weird about it. I don't know why <laughs> I do like, I'm like, thank you. Like, oh, thank you. Like, um, because I, you know, I, I'm like, is what I'm doing that significant, you know? And you have imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever sat with it though. Like I, and, and this is like, not even me just being like, Oh, come on guys, stop. Like it's truthfully, like I, I need to take a, a moment to like sit with what I've done. Right. Like, and, mm -hmm. and take that all in. So when people are like, Oh my God, gosh, you're doing great. It's interesting because in the moments that I actually like have thrived in my career, it's been because I've just showed up as is and as myself. That's and the most beautiful so, lesson. Yeah. And so when someone's like, Hey, you as you is actually pretty awesome. I'm like, really? Like it, it takes you back a little bit, right? Like, or I did that or I inspired that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely still weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear it. I hear it. Too. <laughs> so, um, back in Winnipeg, when you first did your move out of the city to get your mm -hmm. experience, the person who said to you, you should be lucky you even have a job when you look like that as a black yeah. person. Like that's fucked. First of all, that someone said that out oh, loud, yeah. <laughs> but, and they still have their job and have since gotten, uh, promoted. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah. No, but this is like how, but this is how, um, this is how the industry works, right? You can see, we talk about accountability, but are we really about accountability? You know what I mean? I have this question all the time, right? I work for a major company. So do yeah. you, right? I think we both yeah. have a lot, a lot of questions. How did you get through that one? Like, did it fuel your fire? Did it make yeah, you down for a while? Like, oh, yeah. I yeah. was just, because I was just starting out um, and I was at a place where I'm like, do I really belong here? Like, am I really made and cut out for this industry? And then someone essentially told me no. And uh, you get to a point where like, do you listen to this person or do you fight for yourself? And it's funny because I called one of my mentors who's a middle-aged white dude. Um, <laughs> But like, it, it, but it, it, sometimes I'm like, okay, I was, I'm kind of happy that I did because he sees the world through a way different lens. Right. And he was like, you got to get out of there. And I was like, let me have the confidence of this middle-aged white dude to get out of there. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I fought for myself and I said, you know what, if I get blackballed, then this is just not for me. But what I can't do is sacrifice my integrity and feel worthless coming into work and feel like I don't belong here. That to me does not sit well. And especially when you're starting off a career, um, that just doesn't seem right. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I, and it's funny, I left and a month later I was in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. Perfect. So you just, yeah, you applied for I the next job. And I restarted. Yeah. 
did you confront him or her head on? Never. No. Um, I think in proceedings uh, around it, like for sure, we've talked, like I've talked about it, but since I've left Winnipeg, I've never talked to this person, spoken to this person. I think they know who I am. I think oh, they yeah. know that I've said what I've said. Um, but, you know, sometimes people just got to sit with that. Mm-hmm. And I would love to know what they were thinking watching you do, you know, that historical broadcast this year, your yeah. launch, your, launch your new Listen show. Now. Mm-hmm. Look at me now. <laughs> Look at me now. And it's not that you do things to prove people wrong. No. But it's just like, yeah, sometimes you, you, you're like, remember when so-and-so said this and you still did it anyways and you thrive? Like, baby girl, mm-hmm. you are it, right? Like, sometimes you just need those moments. For sure. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about your love for sports and where that started. From what, what I know, it's your grandparents and the Blue Jays. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, even though it's even though I don't really watch the Jays that religiously anymore. Yeah. Again, I think it was just the feel that brought me to it. Like I, I could also sit through like Thursdays and Mondays with my grandfather with him um, watching wrestling and love it just the same. Um, And so that's sort of where it came from. I played soccer, basketball, volleyball also growing up in high school. Um, And it just like kept me, I don't know, it it gave me this community. It gave me this place to release. It gave me this this place to make friends, to kind of get anger and frustration out. Um, It gave me a great place. And um, you know, I always think to like when I went to West Garber Boys and Girls Club and I was there at five, I still have those friends and I'm 28 now. So I still have those friends. Um, it gave me family. And so, yeah, I, I think that I'll always have this little love thing with sports. Um, and even now, just the stories that come from it, covering it gives me such a rush. Um, the conversations that it's already opened up I think for us as a society is incredible um and so yeah that's that's my love affair with 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 the world of sports if someone was going to be interviewing you on on your show the shift what are the kind of things that you would want to talk about if you were oh my gosh flip the camera lens it's like the worst one no I don't like when people do that to me because I'm never prepared (laughs) um hmm. take a minute it's all good life, what I've discovered about myself, what I'm learning currently. Um, I don't know, random things that I'm into. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm like spelling out what people need to ask me on a first date. eh? Uh, (laughs) no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, yeah, I think right now I'm, I'm like really big into getting introspective. Um, and it's helped me a lot through a lot of struggles that I've had recently. Um, so I think that that's sort of where my head is at right now when it comes to conversations that I want to hold space for. You made a comment about uh, your your show, your new show, The Shift, not being just mm-hmm. a place to put all the BIPOC stuff. And yes. I was so glad that you said that because I would I would hate for, you know, one of these major companies to think that, right? Oh, yes. In keeping it about everything and anything that you do want to talk about, uh, what are some of the tougher discussions that you are going to have whether it's on, on your show specifically on the shift, yeah. whether you're anchoring, wh- what are the conversations you as Kayla Gray want to have everywhere? All of the conversations, um, you know, incredibly tough for so many people, of course, um, with that grave discovery of 215 kids um, in Kamloops, um, you know, there is so much uh, repair that needs to happen between our country and the indigenous community. Um, there's also so much learning that I need to still be doing um, and actively doing if I want to claim to be an ally. Um, and so I want to hold space for that because I know that there are people that also feel like they're in the same boat as me um, and and not shying away from that. You know, also too, mental health is a massive uh, thing for me as someone who has struggled with their mental health and still continues to deal with, with mental health issues to, to this day because you never you know it's not like it just yeah. goes away it's constant um, maintenance yeah yeah so you know when Naomi Osaka has to come out and withdraw from the French Open because she has not she's not being supported um you know that's what we want to also talk about that's what we also want to shed light on and you know it's not to say that this is the problem space because these are not problems um this is life and this is humanity right and so why wouldn't we want 
to have space for that in our show. I was going to ask you about the Naomi stuff because like, I mean, I think, I think anyone should be able to understand that there's just a line there and she she exercised a boundary, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, there's going to be people that say, oh, you get paid this much and you're an athlete, wah, wah, wah. But like mental health is something that even the most famous person you could think of still deals with. Yeah. And, and the only right answer to anyone who is trying to think of an opinion or a response is she has to do what's best for her. Mm-hmm. That's the mm-hmm. only right answer. Anyone else that wants to give their two cents about, nah, 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 well, she owes it. Nobody owes you anything. Get over that. The right answer is she needs to do what is best for her to protect her peace. Mm-hmm. And she tried to, but Rolling Girls dropped the bag on that, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, to me, it was just very interesting to see with the reaction around the story of um, this obligation, I feel like people might have to athletes, mm-hmm. the this entitlement to their, their personal space and, um, you know, what they do and do not do. And I know that sounds twisted because I'm part of the media and part of my job runs on this stuff and those interviews and the personal things and the scoops but like you know there's also me the human who understands the importance of boundaries and truly when you respect people's boundaries they can give a little bit more and they can give when they want to because they're in the right space to do so and the content just becomes better so I I don't really have any feelings towards it because I am a member of media Mm-hmm. You, you've probably been in a situation where, you, you know, you're waiting around for a post-game interview and a boundary is exercised. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we'll go with like a Serge Ibaka, for example, takes the longest to to get ready. <laughs> now, that might be upsetting to some people, but like, but that's his routine that those are his boundaries. So when I tell you the man takes long, the man takes like be in the the dressing room like three hours later my man's getting facial or stuff whatever he's doing but like like the quickest he came out of the shower and like got changed I think to talk to media was like when he got ejected from a game when he was here like but again that is the boundary that is how he decompresses after a big after a big performance like he's not obligated to meet my time frame like I'm essentially in his space in his place of business. Um, So, you know, there's that. There's also been times where like, um, for example, when uh, Kyle was supposed to, supposedly going to be traded from the Raptors, that was for the All Women's uh, broadcast. And, uh, you know, there was a request put in like, hey, if Kyle's available after the game, and, you know, Kyle's so gracious and amazing. And, you know, he graciously declined. As one can imagine, if that is your final game with a team you've spent so many years with, um, why, like, you want to take in the, that emotion or, or, or decompress the way that you need to. And what was beautiful is he gave the media 45 minutes of his time after, like the longest he's spent with media. So, you know, it's not like he was like, no, I don't want to talk to you. It's like, no, I'm, I, I'll talk, but in this forum and I in just this, need way, this moment, yeah, yeah, I just need this moment. And no, I, I don't feel the way about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sure. Would it have made, uh, a good post-game interview, I got to talk to Norm who left the next day. Like, so, you know, that's how these things happen and nobody loses. Nobody uh, is upset. Um, and it, Kyle stays. So it's like, yeah, you know, it, again, boundaries, especially uh, when you are thinking about what these athletes do on the court. You're in some sort of zone, intensity, and then all of a sudden you're asked to switch and decompress and answer a bunch of questions. I don't know if I could do it. I, I live oh, yeah. it because I, I am the one with the, the, the mic in their face, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not easy. It can't be easy. It no. can't be easy. It's, it's really nice too seeing like all the hype about your, your new show and like, you know, you've got your peeps on Twitter and everyone's <laughs> congratulating you, but, um, you know, social media plays such a big role in everything that we do too. Yes. Right. How have you found that spotlight, the, the social media spotlight, like uh, outside of just sharing great content that goes along with the show, you got other things you got to deal with too. 
Yes. Uh, it, and it's funny because since episode one, I feel like I've dropped off a little bit on the social media presence. And that's because I just need to take some time for myself boundaries. to put up those boundaries and to get clear on some things that, you know, on my end. But um, yeah, it's this upkeep. It's this feeling like you are kind of always turning, right? You're always having to uh, make sure that you're keeping tabs on everything for not only the show, but for yourself. But I've also learned over the last little while is like engaging when you want to engage. Just be authentic. If you don't feel like posting something, don't post. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, it's okay. Like your work will always stay for itself. Of course, like you want to be consistent and you want to, um, you know, do all of the things and, and be everywhere because let's not lie like that mm-hmm. helps to build and more uh, of a, a bringing to an audience to your show, but you can't be all of the things all the time. And sometimes life happens and sometimes, you know, you have to deal with other things and you just have to deal with those other things. So all the accolades that, you know, people are throwing around, like your, your bio has uh, grown a lot over the <laughs> last year, right? I can sort of sense from what I've heard you say on this topic that you don't think of yourself as like this history making broadcaster and you don't think about that game being that. What what are the things that you come away with something that big from thinking about how proud you are mm-hmm. of yourself? Uh, I think that I'm a pretty cool mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you are. I, I think Levi like I, I I honestly like the only person that like, whose opinion I think I'll care about in the future of what I did and what I've done is my son um when he can verbalize that um and and I have a tough time because sometimes I've had to like not be around him you know I left <laughs> sounds terrible but I did leave him for a whole month um uh, when I was covering the amazing race Canada um and our relationship was like boiled down to FaceTime and that was incredibly hard. Um, but, you know, I had to do what I had to do and, you know, showing my son that doing the things that you have to do, but also that you want to do as well. Um, it's important sometimes and work, working is important and finding something that you are so passionate about and you want to see through that is important and, and, uh, you know, finding your purpose and walking in that and being kind and being gracious. Like those are the examples I think that, um, I'm most proud of is, uh, you know, not really the accolades. They're great. They're cool. Like they're things that like, you know, first with all women's broadcast, like no one's ever going to be able to take that away from me. Um, but, I, I just, when I look on my career, I just see someone who tried and like really, truly like bet on themselves to see it through. And they did. Oh, that's you girl for sure. <laughs> okay. This one's a bit of a, a, a tougher one. And, um, I, I feel like I've heard many of my friends in indigenous communities as well as black communities talk about how, uh, you know, mainstream media does a really good job at sexualizing trauma. Yeah. How, how can we get better at that? Like the me, shift. you, everyone. Watching the shift. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's, that's exactly what it is, is, you know, when you had said earlier about like being like, this is going to be like, sort of like the black space or the, the BIPOC place. Sure. Like, you know, we, we will not lie. Like we, we are diverse behind the scenes. I think it's like all BIPOC staff. Um, the content that you're going to see is all diverse but we're not going to sexualize trauma. We will hold space for those important conversations. But what we want to also do is talk about our joys and our contributions and who we are and what makes our hearts beat fast and, and the ways in which we live and, and how we express. I think that that's beautiful. Um, you know, because again, when you keep seeing trauma over and over again, you lose the sense of attachment or feeling about it. And so now when you continue to see people live, it's, it's, it's so much easier to, to be like, wow, not to say like, oh, it makes you see us as finally as human. But when you see people actually authentically live, when you are someone who are indifferent about them dying, it becomes way harder, Mm -hmm. you know, it becomes Mm -hmm. way harder because life now means something to you because you've seen a group of people live. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like the the toughest thing, but also the the most enjoyable thing to me is like discovering, you know, finding your joy. This has been um, 
such a tough time, such a tough time. I think for everyone, like, I think we're all, uh, you know, even in our way we conversate, the way that we move on a day-to-day basis, we're all in a, we're moving out of a means of survival. Nobody would have expected a pandemic to hit us. Nobody would have expected to have to adjust their lives in certain ways. Like, I don't want to say like, we're all not in our right minds, but, but we're working from, we aren't, (laughs) we, we, we are not. Mm -hmm. Um, and because we should all acknowledge that in each other, it's so important that we give each other grace and compassion through this. Um, but also find those moments of joy and really hold on to them because like I said, we're all not, we're all fine trying to figure it out. So when we have that certainty of this makes me feel good, uh, we have to have to like dive into that fully. It's never a bad thing to have extra spotlight on issues. And I'm going to use this example from, you know, my programming at Sirius XM, but you know, sure there's a black history month and in mm-hmm. women's history month and all of these things. But what I'm really enjoying, like, you know, about what we're planning for June is it's Black Music Month. So we're looking at the celebrations of Black music, right? Yes. And that a lot of that needs to be done in, in sports yes. and entertainment and everything. Yeah. And eventually, because, you know, you guys are so intentional about it, some at some point, it will, won't even be a second thought. So it's yeah. like one week in May, you're like, hey, let's do this. Or one week in November. Yeah. So it's like you, you do it until it just becomes normal. It becomes yeah. normalized. Exactly. I just had this uh, conversation uh, with a guest that I had on this podcast a while ago, Kaylee Cardinal. So she's an Indigenous uh, radio host as well as an award-winning artist. You know, we we got into this conversation about tokenism, which is, I mean, I I worry about that a lot as a white person because (laughs) I'm trying to be an ally, but I never want it to be perceived that I'm giving somebody an opportunity only because of this. And right. Someone has said it to you, like you, you mentioned that someone said yeah. to you, uh, you only got this opportunity because you're black. How, well, like, people always tell me that all the time about sports center. It's hilarious. What, like, how do you react to that? What do you, what do you say to those people? I think my reaction is just like, check the receipts. Like I'm actually really good at my job. <laughs> yeah. I like, love that. Literally the reaction is check the receipts. Like, you know, I worked really hard. I built my way up at TSN. I didn't come in there as a sports anchor. I came in there as a radio producer. Um, and that's no shade to a radio to radio producers by any stretch, but like I, I, you know, moved around in different ways and in different roles, um, and built my way up to where I am. Nobody can take that up for me, take that away from me. I never had anything handed. I worked for everything. Um, and, and I'm damn good. Like, is it, like this is the problem. This is, when people throw out tokenism to you, it's because they know you're damn well good. Yeah. They know. Yeah. They know. They just, they, this, is, this is the excuse. This is the excuse that they, they come up with. And, and it's just like, why? <laughs> why? Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned all your behind the scenes stuff and the producing, and you've even mentioned that you're probably at times going to have, you know, your social media person on the shift. Um, mm-hmm. Talk to me about mentorship in a, a community of female broadcasters behind the scenes people yeah I think mentorship's really important I'm also like in the space of learning the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and so sponsorship of course is like when someone's not in the room how how, what conversations are you having about them to bring them in the room whereas mentorship is when you're one-on-one with someone and how you're kind of empowering them to get into the room and so I'm kind of learning the difference about both and moving more into like the sponsorship role of like how can I help facilitate Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I've had incredible mentors along the way for me. I always talk highly, highly of Marcy Ian. Um, she has been huge for me. She has had my back since day one. She has, uh, spoke up for me in rooms that I have never spoke. I have, you know, I have not been in. She's put my name forward for things. She's just a great friend. Um, and you know, when you have that example, you just can't help but want to do that for other people. Um, you know, the way that my leadership style is, is a lot different is like, you know, some people are like, oh my God, she's like, everyone's friend here. And it's not the case, but I, I want it to be a safe place. I want it to be a safe place. And, you know, you go back to the conversation about middle school, high school, I just didn't feel safe, which meant I didn't feel understood. And so that those can transfer to the workspace of like, if you make everyone feel safe and understood and appreciated and valued for their contributions, great things can happen. 
And it's not to say that work doesn't get done because we're all having fun. Like, trust me, if I want to get stern, we can, we can get stern. But when you have that safe environment and everyone feels empowered, uh, feedback or critiques don't come off as weird. It's just, just proactive. Actually, yeah. it's proactive. It's productive. It's how do we collectively get to the bigger goal? Um, and so that's sort of like my forms of styles of leadership. It might be unconventional for some, but that I think has worked so far with our show. Mm-hmm. So I want to end on on you know that historical Raptors broadcast, and uh, for you, it's about the women that you were alongside. And you yes. were proud to be alongside those women. Talk to me about the qualities, yes. the qualities of those women that you admire and how being amongst them made you feel empowered. Oh my gosh. Kia is someone who is just super fun, loving, um, really, really cares about her craft, really, really cares about her craft. And is she just a boss? She's just so good. Um, and, and yeah, I, I love being around Kia. Uh, Megan is a go-getter. She goes for it. She's a shark man. Um, and you know, she has worked so hard to get to where she has, and she's not afraid to uproot to do what she got to do. Kate, incredibly sound in who she is, very sure of herself, very sure of what she's about. Um, you know, the ways in which she's been an advocate for women in general is just something I admire so much. And Amy is just a boss. Like Amy was just, just such a boss in what she does. She's super informed. She takes great care in her preparation. Uh, and that's what it is for me is to be around these women. Um, of course, it was such a great day for like not only the network, not only for the MBA, but it was a beautiful day for me to just be around dope people who are just dope at what they do. Like, it, like there's, there's nothing um, I think that makes me happier than being around people that are just clearly walking in the path that is meant for them. Um, and I see that in all of these late, the, all of the women that I was working alongside and to have that for that, that special moment and to get a winner to that game. That was the only one of the month, by the way. Um, <laughs> by the drafters, it, that's something I'm never going to forget. Yeah. Would you show me your plaque that you got? I also moved in not too long ago, which is a lie, November, but this is the plaque. Look at it. Look at our big heads. Okay. Not everyone's big heads, but my big head. Me. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And oh my also, God. I know. How amazing is this? This is, a, I'm embarrassed that I have not hung it yet, but we're going to try and find a cute place to put it, you know? Cute. It better be front and center somewhere. Right? Just somewhere. Special I just, one. I know there's so many like big moments that like I want to like print off and frame. And I'm just like, if someone walks into my house eventually when COVID's over, they're going to think I'm just so into myself. No, I, I think this is the problem. You earn to celebrate that. Yeah. But I, so, I have the same experience, like all the, yes, all the same stuff. I don't know what that is. Um, there's so many photos that I took from um, the championship parade. And so I want to get that all blown up and put into one of my hallways. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, this industry that we're in, because these moments are really, really captured. <laughs> They're not even iPhone. Like they literally, you can find them in an archive somewhere. And so I'm just trying to do what I can to, to hold on to those moments and, and be present with them as opposed to, um, you know, trying to, to keep chasing the next thing. Like I need to get better at celebrating myself. hundred percent. We all do. So I normally end uh, these episodes by asking you to pick a couple women that you think should uh, come on. Yes. So, I mean, you've mentioned several women, you can choose from any of them, but tell me why about what about their stories you think? Um, if you I mean, to- Kathleen newman Bermang is my best friend. So <laughs> I mean, she's no, but she's just incredible with her pen. And uh, she, tr- I truly believe she will change the world with her words. Um, like truly, she is a bona fide star. Um, another that's Kathleen person, from, that's Kathleen from Refinery. Refinery, oh. yeah. Um, Gabriella Estrada, um, she, gosh, I'm going to blank out on her organization, but what she's so incredible for is she works in, Scar- she's from Scarborough, so you know, of course I love her, um, and we actually knew each other in high school, but she is uh, someone who is just such an advocate for women in sports, but also she like goes into deeper with her researching and findings of, of why 
why we girls stop playing and specifically women of color um, at a certain particular age um, stop playing. And I think her work is, is so fascinating. Trina Med is also very fascinating as well. Uh, she does work with TSN as well as she hosts the Burn It Down podcast. And uh, she's just, she's funny. She's hilarious. She got, she is just, this this warrior in my mind of of someone who just embodies like strength and and how to do it right in this industry so those are my my three <laughs> so kayla you're amazing um you are amazing thank no. you so much i feel like i was in a, a therapy session trust me it's been a week girl no this is uh this is amazing and i mean i've been watching what you're doing and uh congrats on the new show and thank you so much for making some time for mine thank you so much for having me you gotta definitely chat outside of your show and I hope we get to like meet at an event in real life sometime. Email me. I cannot wait to have a drink in real life with Kayla Gray. What a career. And to think she's really just getting started. You can find out more about Kayla and her new show, The Shift, in the episode notes. Pass the episode along to someone you think needs to hear it. Subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And please follow along at Women in Media Pod on social media to keep up with guest announcements and more. My next guest will get us into another discussion about representation as a queer radio host, and she may even inspire you to get on TikTok. I just hope she'll teach me how to use it better. Until then, I'm Sarah Burke, and thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Matt Kundal, host of the Sound Off podcast, the podcast about broadcast. Every week since 2016, we've been bringing on broadcast leaders to talk about their experiences in radio, what they've seen, and where they believe it is all going. If you live and love radio, subscribe to the Sound Off Podcast with Matt Kundal wherever you get your podcasts. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.